Um, back in 2012, uh, there's been an important uh, publication, uh, well, a very successful publication because it has received plenty of awards. And uh, it's an essay, sort of a reportage, from uh, Catherine Poe, an American journalist. And uh, it was very attractive, well, especially for the title. And the name is Belle per sempre, or Forever Beautiful. I remember that that was a sort of a dramatic story, a dramatic and surreal, because it was set in an Indian slum, uh, you know, with a typical, well, scenario of, of you know, deep, uh, profound uh, poverty, uh, which is, you know, the typical, you know, environment that you find in some Indian slums. And I remember that there was a sort of a distinctive element there to this landscape. There was, uh, you know, a big, big ad, and in Italian, the, the, the words were belle per sempre, forever beautiful. And that was the slogan of an advertising, um, you know, campaign for, um, I mean, Italian tiles. It was uh, right there between the end of the slum and the uh, beginning, if you will, of the uh, Mumbai airport. A sort of a promise of a happy world available to everyone. That was also the spirit uh, that we had in uh, uh, creating this uh, book, L'Atlante della Ceramica, the Ceramics Atlas. It's a sort uh, of a diary and um, helping us or helping people trace at least uh, the scope or the perimeter of this uh, uh, creative, productive uh, district that was uh, uh, fundamental in order to modernize Italy some decades ago because the explosion of that ceramics district coincided with the first wave of modernization of Italy soon after the Second World War. So, of course, I'm talking about the uh, tile industry. Now, we usually say that this is the, uh, once again, tile industry. Maybe this is not appropriate. It is beautiful, but mass-produced. It is small, but can extend indefinitely. It is functional, but also a dream machine. It is silent, but it speaks of how we are, how we were, perhaps of how we will be. This is the topic of the Atlas of Italian Ceramics, a historical and geographical map of the Italian ceramics cladding production from the post-war period to date. A project by Marta Ceramica, the Atlas is a journey through time and space, which tells us how the now grown-up tile has become a global solution for decoration. As almost every successful narrative, the story of industrial ceramics too starts from a crisis, that is, the post-war period, when Italy needed not only reconstruction but also modernization. It needed to improve housing standards and build an industrial system that would be equal to the recovery from war. The production model of industrial ceramics turned out to be one of its driving forces. Just the Sassuolo district went from 14 to 102 businesses between 1955 and 1962. At the dawn of the economic boom, the market of cladding for construction made the Italians dream of a polished and shining domestic world, like the one shown by Richard Ginori's advertisements. The conquest of the bathroom and kitchen was the first stage of an expansion that now included all the rooms in the house. Every season brings a step forward in the use of ceramics for construction, said Marazzi's triumphant motto. The time of forbidden spaces, the bathroom, the kitchen, is coming to an end, a battle won. Italy moved from an economy of capital goods to an economy of consumer goods. It was capitalism, but also, as Guido Piovani observed, the attempt to prevent art from becoming useless, that is to preserve its necessity in modern life. Art falls in love with industry, poetically said Gio Ponti, who imagined it as an antidote to smoky industrial cities. 
as he taught how to clad the surfaces of the Pirelli skyscraper in Milan, the Parco dei Principi Hotel in Sorrento, and even the Denver Art Museum in Colorado, Ponti opened the doors to design. He inaugurated a new way, a leap forward for Italian industry in the world. New companies were added to the few born in the previous 20 years, but now they were not only located in the triangle of Emilia, Lombardy and Veneto, the southern region started to produce ceramics too, with Campania being one of the first. In Vietre sul Mare, before leaving for America, Paolo Soleri completed his masterpiece, the Solomini factory. In Salerno, Ceramica d'Agostino took the family business into the future thanks to the collaboration with Gio Ponti. In 1968, in Cava dei Terreni, Cava worked with Pierre Cardin and thus opened the doors of ceramics to the invasion of fashion designers, who in the following decades would compete for inventive supremacy with pure designers. Yes, because in order to achieve international acknowledgement, ceramics demanded quality. Producers turned into publishers. To build a system is not enough just to conceive and produce. You need to spread and communicate. To create an audience attentive to what is new in the market. This is how specialized magazines were born. Advertising was refined. Awards were created. And trade shows and industry associations were promoted. It is clear that ceramics could promote the aesthetic education of the Italians and change their lifestyles. Art and graphics moved from canvases directly onto the walls. Programmed art, abstract art, pop art, arte povera, and then postmodern figuration went back and forth in our homes, opening windows onto total environments to be lived in as if rooms were the spaces of a domestic Kunstgalerie. However, creativity was not limited to design alone. In 1987, the American economist Michael Porter claimed that Italy was dominant for its technological supremacy and ingenious production systems. Since then, innovations have followed one another at great speed, allowing the national industry to hold on to the podium in global competition, even in times of crisis. In order to face the challenge of low cost quantity and unfair imitation, the national ceramics industry has now committed to a continuous effort to exceed its limits and open up new frontiers. The sustainability and hygiene of the new materials which were tragically kick-started by the pandemic and by the issue of environmental waste have contributed to keeping the competition tough together with the reconversion of workplaces into the smart factory format. Even more so, factories are now also open showcases for the public as they feature museums, conferences and events that turn them into attractive centres for the entire territory. I think there is an Italian way whose influence may be seen in the design. So uh, we have a question that uh, we want to ask uh, the two guests we have tonight. We have Andrea Cancellato, he's the project manager at the Design Museum Compasso d'Oro, a museum that will open soon in Milan. He's the former director of uh, Triennale in Milan. So this is what he did for many years. I think that, um, yes, we do have to talk about the so-called the Italian way plus made in Italy, as we usually say, just because, you know, design is much more than made in Italy products. I mean, it is the fruit of so many skills 
and capabilities I have in today with the project, the construction, creation, communication, marketing efforts. I mean, there's a complex system represented by many different activities, including materials. So, well, basically, uh, all of this, uh, uh, you know, turns into products uh, or, uh, well, products in order to meet uh, the uh, demand of people. But this is so important for people's daily life. Our surfaces today are not just a phenomenon having to do with uh, our interior architecture. Uh, rather, you know, they are the key elements, if you will, of some uh, micro uh, design, micro interventions, if you will, in an urban setting. This is what they can do for our cities. So they can create uh, new elements in our cities. So this means that we can live better uh, in important urban spaces. So the Italian way, well, this is what I mean by this. I mean, we have to interconnect uh, the system of things or objects on the one side with the system of life on the other. The second guest we have today is Daniele Palico. Now, Daniele uh, is a researcher. So uh, he's a researcher at the Roma 3 University in Rome. So he explores the relationships between the literature, arts, and, you know, the background that is the anthropological changes that come with those transformations. And I have to say that in this very case, I would like to remind you that Daniele Perico was the author uh, back in 2016 of a book that was so um, interesting for us, Made in Italy and Culture investigations on the contemporary uh, Italian identity. If you want to talk about the relationship with Italian reality and design, well, oh, this is very easy if you, uh, well, overcome the national boundaries. I've spent some time in New York to do research. I was doing something totally different. But when I was there, I was really surprised of the physical presence of Italy there. I mean, Italy, unlike many other European cultures, was really, really there, really present, I mean, in objects, even in the words of people. You know, Starbucks uh, is now using so many Italian words, and this is incredible because, you know, we think we are a small country without a huge, you know, globalization trends with, let's say, a minority language, even if, you know, Italian represents such an important culture. I think that the key point is the following, the so-called system of objects. I mean, the Italian design industry in the past um, 40, 50, maybe 60 years, we've been able to create a strong identity, well, especially abroad. Well, here in Italy, if you will, we live with this. So we sort of... Uh, we uh, maybe uh, do not really believe in what we um, uh, are, so some difficulties and then, you know, some crisis times. Anyway, these two systems, I mean, for those of you who live or work in Italy, so this, uh, you know, uh, go hand in hand. In many cases, we are so, you know, negative. As soon as we get out of Italy, we are surprised by the force, the strength, the impact of a specific way of being Italian. Well, maybe today uh, it's a system of objects, as I like to say, a system of habits, uh, uh, which has a very specific, you know, connotation. You know, sometimes we are almost, uh, you know, radically uh, going against them, you know, standardization or mass consumption on a very consistent way, which is the typical, you know, way of doing of the previous forms of modernization. I mean, the American one and then the uh, Anglo-French one. Ours is a sort of anti-modern modernity, going back to craftsmanship. We go back to the five senses. We really, really leverage many elements of our daily life. I mean, the taste, the flavor, the senses, the colors. So there's a, um, an incredibly modern image of Italy. I know it's an ideal, maybe idealized, the stereotyped image of Italy, but anyway, um, 
because this kind of image uh, manages to define a different kind of modernity, so the Italian way of enjoying modernity, if you will. And of course, this is no longer a minority, if you will, out of Italy. There are so much, I mean, there's plenty of demand, there's a key attention, a key focus on uh, how the Italian culture has been interpreting modernity. Um, so the best way to observe this, well, of course, we do have some incredible representations of culture, including uh, cinema. And I think that the key point is design. This is interesting. I do agree with this. I mean, while you were, you know, talking, I was thinking of... Uh, I was thinking, you know, that this kind of debate, I mean, the construction of this, you know, storytelling or narrative is really ancient. I mean, it goes back to many, many years ago. There's a famous book written in 1955. So that was, uh, you know, soon after the end of the Second World War. So the, uh, you know, beginning of Reconstruction, the dawn of the economic miracle. There's a, there was a, uh, Kid Smith, an American researcher, I mean, he came to Italy with a fellowship to study here, and he wrote a book that was also uh, be published, I mean, in Italian. Italy Builds. So it's an, a window open on a specific country. People said, okay, well, these are the windows of Italy after the Second World War, where we have some, you know, uh, craftsmanships and then there are so many small, if you will, um, you know, professionals. But he was surprised by new objects and new shop windows and new products. And he said, well, they have invented their own modernity, which is different from the uh, US modernity. And this modernity, so in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, description, so he goes back to the uh, Italian territory and then ancient architecture plus modern architecture. So the idea was a seamless continuity. Uh, I have a question for you, um, Andrea. I'm sure that your answer can give us an important contribution. Um, you've been managing this many years uh, the uh, Triennale in Milan. So now your task is uh, strategic, if you will. So, so once again, what to do is taking care of ADI and the Compasso d'Oro Museum. Um, do you agree with what uh, Mr. Varico said? So this Italian identity is stronger abroad than in Italy? Yes, I think so. Uh, very few countries, I mean, considering the size uh, have had and still have a, an incredible importance internationally uh, like Italy or like the uh, Italian design um, specifically because if you consider the Italian design I think that one of the key points of modernity and contemporaneity if you will are from from Italy is represented by design I mean quite often we've been able to see that this is one of the very very few uh, industries if you will it, it, I mean, um, uh, in terms of, you know, professional activities or study or research uh, that are, I, is able to attract the international, uh, let's say, brain, you know, from the rest of Italy. Um, it, it doesn't happen by chance. I mean, this is happening because there's an incredible combination between, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing products and, you know, our creativity. This is uh, one of the key points we have here in Italy, the so-called Italian way, as you uh, say before. And I think this is really, really crucial and fundamental when it comes to recognize our system, so the Italian system. So even the simple fact that, you know, uh, many different uh, um, design museums in the world, in their, let's say, uh, programming, so in their agenda, there is always something concerning Italy. Um, specific uh, exhibition, uh, maybe an exhibition on a specific person, maybe a specific decade or, you know, a movement. There's always something on Italy or from Italy. Now, you, you know very well that... Um, so once again, in the agenda, if you will, of the uh, big but also small design museums around the world, Italy is always there. So, um, based on what Andrea says, um, you know, we know that you've been able to uh, analyze this idea, which is, you know, the identity we have thanks to uh, many different forms of expression including literature. 
We know that in general, you know, uh, we, we want to maintain a specific relationship with tradition. Uh, this is sort of a, a, a something that happens by default. But what are the typical features of Italian creativity? Well, thank you for the question. I remember that about this um, some years, I mean, before uh, he died, I interviewed uh, um, Mendini. Mendini said, well, my lamps are now made in Korea, but in Korea, they wanted to write made in Italy, even if they were made in Korea, just because in many different industries and sectors, the fact, uh, I mean, the geographical belonging of the, uh, well, so-called Italy brand automatically means beauty, elegance and quality. So the geographical, um, you know, uh, origin is a key feature of objects just because they are, you know, thought of or designed in Italy. And this is interesting because for many other, let's say, geographically dependent productions, is not happening. For example, if you say made in Germany, we think of you know top technology, industrial quality. If you, if you think of made in China, well, almost automatically this means you know endless um, economies of scale. Now this is a conflict, uh, you know, sort of. Um, Yes, it's a conflict between different markets. I mean, it's also a stereotype. I mean, every market makes this to build its own identity. But I have to say that when it comes to Italy, people around the world always think of this a quality made of elegance and beauty, accuracy, precision. And once again, this is a, a new modernity that establishes a connection with individuals. I mean, something which is really, really able to make your life uh, um, more enjoyable, um, happier. So th th this, this thing, I mean, enjoyment or pleasure of this experience sort of represents all of the typical features of objects made in Italy. This is really impressive, very uh, unique. Now, Italy uh, has to, to, to keep investing, I mean, in making investments on uh, culture, on the uh, let's say project industry the beauty of its cities of its you know uh, territories and of course uh, well there's something that we don't have to do which is uh, just considering the history okay so museums are not just made to celebrate the past so they are made to celebrate and to think of the future I think that one of the fundamental components of this uh, uh, storytelling throughout the Ceramics Atlas is the point that having to do with the enhancements and promotion of uh, all of the uh, innovative work that is carried out by uh, industrialists, designers and artists on a seamless uh, basis. So what is really, really very important is a um, um, contest that was launched uh, nine years ago, La Ceramica e il Progetto, Ceramics and the Project. This is the name of the contest. Now, um, there have been, uh, well, a very important members of the jury. The current jury is now chaired by Mario Cucinella. Um, there's also been, uh, well, more and more people, uh, let's say, um, attending, more and more architects. So once again, they uh, participate into, if you will, this award or contest. This is uh, a very important acknowledgement of recognition of the work they do. Now, uh, you can uh, find all of the results and the awards online or in many different archives of this project. All of this uh, is uh, regularly published in small books. Now, these booklets, if you will, are really, really very useful because they give you the opportunity to have the status of things and they also tell you um, about the importance of uh, ceramic uh, products at all levels of design, for example, from small scale to large urban scale. The ceramic tile is particularly a beautiful material because it's an ancient material. You know, if you go to ancient buildings, 3,000 years old, you'll find this warmth in the material. And unlike steel or concrete, when you touch the material, it's, it's human. It's not a cold, abstract material. Plus, it's 21st century material because it's so robust. 
impossible to be scratched, impossible to damage. So it has characteristics of the 21st century and also 21st century back. And I think that's what makes it uh, a fascinating material that I love using because it's, it's, it just relates to the human being. So thanks to the Atlas of Ceramics, uh, um, we have talked about the uh, importance that archives or history uh, have. So, of course, I'm not just talking about the institutional I mean, museums, of course, but I'm, I'm talking here about, um, you know, a phenomenon which is quite recent, uh, with, which has to basically almost just happened in this field, which is designed. Of course, I'm talking about the so-called the corporate museum. So museums are having to do with the archives of companies that are some pieces of the, uh, you know, um, history of, of some, you know, tile makers. Uh, you know, the idea is that um, I think that this is something that's happening uh, and this is very positive. So uh, companies, the tile makers now know that a museum is uh, such an important uh, asset. So it is not just, uh, let's say, uh, a historical, you know, um, let's say, asset just, uh, you know, to make sure that family is considered as important. I mean, it helps uh, characterize that brand on the market. And also in, in cultural, in broader cultural terms, uh, this strengthens uh, the um, corporate identity of a company. I would like to talk about this with Patrizia Familietti. She's the creative director of uh, Ceramica Francesco de Maio. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, well inviting me. Well, um, you're right. Um, so uh, a corporate museum or a museum in a company. Now, first of all, you have to have, um, well, a story to tell and a history behind you. And of course, this is something that we can do here, which is the, uh, uh, you know, story of the uh, ceramics here in Vietri. Um, this is a promise made to uh, Francesco De Maio. So um, right here, very close to the, uh, well, to the, um, you know, production center, he wanted to create a place to show the cultural heritage that we have at this company. So after his uh, death, uh, I, well, strove to keep the promise. So this means that, you know, I went back to the, uh, well, historical archives. Uh, so this is what, uh, uh, you know, um, well, we, we've been able to collect in the family. It's a major, important archive because, as you know, uh, Francesco Di Maio and the families who founded, you know, Francesco Di Maio, so Di Maio and Cassetta, they have a very long uh, cultural identity, well, basically starting from the end of the 15th century. So we had to go back to all of these objects um, and their pictures, uh, uh, photos, and then tiles, uh, you know, from the very origin, uh, you know, of this ceramic uh, industry here in Vietri or in Naples. So basically, I just wanted to, uh, you know, recompose the, uh, well, the history of these two families by making a story. And I, I really understood, you know, why Francesco Di Maio really, really wanted to build this, uh, if you will, um, corporate museum. Well, the reason is very simple. Um, there's really just one simple reason, which is uh, making sure people can see uh, what was done here. So this is a huge uh, cultural, artistic, you know, heritage that you can find in or even behind uh, the art of ceramics. I think that, um, well, uh, here in the De Mayo company, we have different kinds of people who, you know, come visit us. So the people who come here for the first time, I mean, visiting the museum for the first time, well, they really, really understand this incredible heritage. So this is a specific art that we have here in Vietri. And then, you know, these visitors understand uh, the ceramics today. So they understand uh, why we have this, you know, hand-painted, hand-decorated uh, Maiolicas, so, um, you know, ceramics today. Um, this is also important for the people working in the company. So we also decided where to create the museum, which is right at the main entrance of the company, Francesco de Maio. Those who work with us, of course, so you have to sort of, you know, walk very close to the museum, almost through it. And this means that you really, really take part into the, uh, you know, um, history and heritage we have here. Thank you so much. Now, uh, uh, another uh, question. Um, 
do you think that there can be tools in order to uh, you know merge the knowledge of the museum and the archives of the museum we've been invited to take part in some uh, foundations because um, those foundations really asked us to make sure the small museum may be visited by more and more people so possibly and in the near future we will be included into a sort of a, a cluster of important museums so we are showing tiles but we do much more than this i mean this is art this is culture we would like you know to uh, to show this to the rest of the world i mean how we used to do this and how we are still doing this this is good not just for our company i think that this will increase the value of the italian ceramics industry I have to say that a major uh, part, if you will, of this uh, um, atlas of ceramics, uh, which is the book we are talking about tonight. Well, so what, one important chapter, if you will, is dedicated to a very important phenomenon that has characterized, uh, you know, our country well, starting from the end of the 1960s and then from the beginning of the 1970s. It has uh, characterized the industry and the uh, creativity of the uh, design world having to do with floor and wall tiles. I'm talking about the, let's say, this kind of marriage with this kind of uh, combination. Um, it sounds like an oxymoron, but um, you may not believe in this. But anyway, there's been an incredible cooperation between uh, floor and wall tiles on the one side and fashion on the other. So, well, if you think about this, I mean, fashion is uh, the way, I mean, you cover your body, right? And tiles, uh, well, this is something that you use to cover, for example, walls and floors. So there is something in common. This is what uh, Maria Canella has written for us. We have the pleasure to have her as one of our guests uh, tonight. Now, um, for the audience we have uh, today, um, can you tell us about, I mean, this uh, kind of cooperation? So fashion, when it comes uh, in contact with uh, ceramics. Now, the tile um, world, as we say, um, undergoes the plenty of changes and transformations after the end of the Second World War. Let's say that uh, that world was a little, let's say, tired. Um, because uh, once again, uh, that was the sort of, you know, end of rationalism, there was an extreme simplification. So at the end of the 1950s, and then in the beginning of the 1960s, uh, um, basically there was a drop of the uh, figurative language represented by ceramics or tiles in general. So that was a language that tiles could offer to architects and designers. So it is not by chance that fashion decides to step into this world because um, um, this is, uh, let's say, a high level, if you will, stream of thoughts. I mean, there's been a revolution of designers and then we create, you know, the Made in Italy uh, brand having to do with industrial design. So, of course, it doesn't only concern, if you will, the, the uh, collaboration from some designers or fashion designers, but what was happening at that time was a total revolution of the industrial production. So it is not by chance that also the world of ceramics or, you know, the tile making industry was involved in this new theory. So fashion designers wouldn't have joined us without, for example, the uh, Rinascente or Compassador Awards in 1954, and then ADI, the Italian Design Association, and then New Liberty Style Exhibition. So once again, we go back to the so-called uh, figurative um, art. And there was also an artistic revolution. I think that the most interesting thing is that, you know, the fact of having fashion designers also brings about a, a, a revolution which is right inside, I mean, manufacturing or tiles uh, production. Now, this means that, um, well, more expensive lines uh, are creative. So we have uh, new colors, we have new techniques, new manufacturing technologies. I mean, tiles become much more complex. I mean, in terms of, you know, the process, the manufacturing process. And we also have many different formats. Roberta Di Camerino, for example, 
uh, promotes a plenty of rectangular uh, you know, tiles, which are a little bit more complex to be managed versus these squares tiles. And she does this because, I mean, she wants to highlight her typical design, which is represented by bows, ribbons, belts, or domestic shapes. So, uh, can you choose a fashion designer or an industrialist that was really, really radical into this, uh, let's say, uh, marriage or combination of efforts? Well, Valentino. Uh, Valentino has a flower uh, language, but he really, really takes into account the tile system. So, he invented a specific decoration from the individual tile and then all the way up to the frames, but also on the so-called panels that you can see here. So uh, if, you, if you know the tile industry, you know what I mean. I mean, you have uh, so-called full field or placed uh, decorations, which is what we also use in other uh, branches of design. So he manages to create uh, extraordinary modular collections. Uh, and uh, uh, there was plenty of room also for the architects. Uh, and uh, there was uh, also plenty of room for uh, layers. Talking about the Atlas of Ceramics, uh, there's a key topic I'd like to uh, uh, bring up, which is the uh, Museums of Ceramics. Now, we have uh, a very important guest uh, today, and uh, we have questions for him on ceramics museums. Uh, Mr. Poncemi is Marca Corona's Managing Director. Marca Corona is one of those companies uh, uh, in this district that first, and uh, let's say with very generous open views, well, they have uh, created their own museum or corporate museum. Mr. Pachemi, uh, is this right? Yes, so before introducing Marca Corona's museum, I would like to, to make a leap backward in history and uh, talk about the uh, you know, uh, history of the Sassuolo district of ceramics, uh, starting uh, around in 1750. So it all starts uh, with some you know, family-run small companies or you know, uh, entrepreneurs. So they create some terracotta or, if you will, clay products. So they needed the support of the local duke in order to have funds and to, to do some cooperation and collaborations to sell the products in the local communities. Then these families start you know, creating workshops and then workshops uh, become small companies, small manufacturing plants. I have to say that Marca Corona was uh, involved directly into that kind of development. So uh, this is basically one of the uh, branches of this historical development. So Marca Corona was sort of forced or felt obliged to uh, tell about its story because the telling our story means uh, talking about the entire history of the Sassuolo district of ceramics. Uh, in the Villa Rubiani, um, the company tried to talk about you know, the history of ceramics. So Marca Corona has, uh, you know, taken into account that, uh, let's say, old idea in terms of the pieces, the masterpieces we got through this museum, but also the spirit was the same. I mean, we just wanted to rebuild the cultural, historical evolution of the Sassuolo ceramics. Uh, this is what we have done in the museum. So this museum was uh, officially opened in 2010. It is... Uh, dedicated to the president of the uh, Gruppo Concord, because Marco Corona is included into the Concord group. Uh, they helped us develop our museum, and this is the spirit we have here. So we want to show the uh, development of this art, and then the uh, development of the local district, and then how the district has reacted to the presence of ceramics or tile making industry. So all of this is stored in our museum. I have to say that recently, in the past years, um, the museum, uh, well, uh, let's say, uh, was uh, uh, receiving new projects. So uh, 
let's say that for some years after 2010, almost uh, no other products were added to the collections, while now, recently, we have added new products. So we want to talk about the people who have worked here and even the entrepreneurship of those people have always been the light motive, you know, the fil rouge of the development of sustainable ceramics. So, uh, who are your visitors? Well, now the museum is open to the public and willingly so. So, well, here we have visitors coming to visit the district in Sassuolo, of course, with the customers of our company, tourists of this territory, some events and initiatives we have. We also have uh, uh, school children. So we have schools from every kind of, from every type of school basically coming here. Uh, you know, this district is so important for the Modena region, but also for the entire region where we are, which is Emilia Romagna. So we want to show uh, how the, how much the ceramic industry is important. So when it comes to the museum, so um, do you think that the museum is also good, if you will, for your production capabilities, or is it just a, uh, a beautiful uh, homage to the uh, well to history yes um, it's it's to pay homage to history but at the same time we keep our eyes open to the future um, because you know in the uh, description of the development of the ceramics here in the Sassuolo district I have to say that um, a specific connotation has been given a very strong connotation has been given to the uh, innovation capabilities so we have been able to show here from workshops and companies and then organizations i mean this is what we've been doing here for centuries we also highlight the importance of workers entrepreneurs that we have had here so if you consider this perspective this is also a projection into the future because once again for ceramics i mean for this territory of course we are deeply linked to our own communities i mean to the local you know, district, the territory, there's a strong engagement and commitment from entrepreneurs and there's a high level of collaboration with workers and employees. So it's a long, uh, you know, story that's uh, continuing.